today, Jason. Love it. I love it. Me too. <laughs> I put on a collar. I see that. Just like your rabbinical days. Just like my rabbinical days. I, and I actually, because I had to do something first, I actually have shoes on, which is like the third time since March. I haven't worn yeah, shoes since February that. 23rd. It's the weirdest hello, hello. feeling. Okay, I'm going to interrupt our conversation to welcome everybody else into it. Um, thank you to those of you who have been watching the Sanibel Island Online Writers Conference this year. We've had uh, a bunch of great sessions, and we have a few more left to go. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro for this session and then get out of your way. I have John Schimmel and Todd Goldberg here with me, and they are going to be talking about video game narratives, which I'm really excited about because I play a lot of video games, and storytelling has kind of been bubbling up to the surface of a lot of the conversations in the recent, in more recent years, I guess. Like Gamers are actually paying attention to it now rather than just mm -hmm. like ripping through games or whatever. So I'm really interested to hear what these two guys have to say about it. Um, John is a senior producer of narrative content for Cloud Imperium Games, and he has a lot of experience. Um, Todd apparently has none yeah. writing video <laughs> games, but he's also written how many how many dozens of other things uh, that we talked about. I have I've written uh, I've written 15 books, and I know John very well, and have asked him all these questions once before, at least in the middle of the night. <laughs> Awesome. But <laughs> so he's a very experienced writer and has some video game experience, I can only imagine. Yes. John actually was the inspiration for the first barrel in Donkey Kong. Interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to try and find something to, to say to that, but I'm, it's, it's failing me. <laughs> I'm going to turn it I'm going to turn it over to uh John and Todd. Thanks guys Great. and have fun. Thanks Jason Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our talk. It's a pleasure to have you here on a Sunday when you could be watching uh, football. Also, don't anyone tell me what's happening in the Raider game. I'm recording it in that room over there. And I anticipate, even though they're the Raiders, that they're beating the Buccaneers. Um, we have an exciting talk. We're going to talk. The two of us are going to talk for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to open it up to answer all of your questions, which I know will be plentiful. Uh, because John is a man who has had a fascinating career and is doing some amazing stuff in the video game world. Um, before we get specifically to video game narratives, John, I want to talk a little bit about your path to this career that you have now in the video game world. You've done, it seems like everything. Uh, you've written, you, you've literally gone from Broadway to the video game. <laughs> Can you can you talk a little bit about sort of your theory of storytelling encompassing your career, which really has gone from music to film, journalism, uh, and now to to video games itself? That's not a big topic, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately. Um, so I started my career. I was a I was a bass player, and in college. Uh, a friend of mine opened a coffee house and a woman named Elizabeth Suedos came down from Bennington College to Wesleyan University to play at the coffee house and participate in Wesleyan's world music program. And she and I became friends and, uh, and she was deeply gifted. So I decided to hook my wagon to her star. And um, <laughs> I followed her for two summers. We played folk festivals for Pete Seeger's um, Clearwater Festival. And then wow. we mi migrated to New York um, to start working at La Mama Experimental Theater, mm -hmm. where Elizabeth Suedos and John Schimmel were two thirds of the band for the La Mama African American Company, which <laughs> tells you everything you need to know about La Mama Experimental Theater. <laughs> Um, but but Lamont, the the work that I did there, it, it, I can't talk about it in Hollywood at all because nobody really quite quite gets it. But um, the bit the, the 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 of the many shows I did there, the one that was the most important in terms of of, of storytelling, I guess, was uh, uh, I did early work on on a production of Medea that Liz wrote the music for and, and Andre Serban directed. And it was an experiment in nonverbal communication in theater. Mm -hmm. We, we, it was allegedly in ancient Greek and Latin, but nobody spoke that. And I think it was, I've always thought it was completely made up. <laughs> um, but, but it was an experiment in, in, in putting 
putting forward a, a Greek tragedy really with no words. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 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 and it's sort of like everything else, it, it bleeds into the work I've done in, in movies since, because one of the great lines about screenwriting is a great screenplay and a great screenplay dialogue is subtitle, right? It's the visual imagery that, so mm -hmm. that's been interesting. Anyway, so I did that for a, for a while and that I, we migrated from the ex La Mama to the Joe Paps Public Theater and we did uh, a show called Runaways, which moved to Broadway, and we did a production of Cher The Cherry Orchard that w was sort of a big deal at Lincoln Center. And um, and then I wrote a script. I just I decided that I had had enough of New York, and I wrote a script with a with a colleague, and we sold it to Fox, and had this very interesting ride where. We we met we delivered the script on a Friday morning. The following Monday, we got a call from our producer saying it was brilliant and he was going to talk to the studio executive to find a director. And at four, call us and said the studio was abandoning the project, <laughs> which might tell you a lot about the movie business. Um, yeah, that, that sounds like a great day. <laughs> it was it was a great day. It almost killed me literally because of the amount of tequila that I drank drank as a as a consequence. <laughs> um, but I went, I, I, I went back to New York hiccuping and hung over and called some friends and the friends were just putting together, um, they had, they had tr converted a bar band into a show and the show became Pump Boys and Dinettes for gas station attendance, uh, in a gas station across highway 57 from, from, um, a diner run by the, the double cup diner by the cup sisters and that um became my first ex experience of viral um and I, I still have no explanation of it we opened at 11 o'clock at night in an off off broadway stage we were borrowing somebody else's set after they came down and we ran i think i think we ran for two weeks and uh opening night there were six of us on stage and four people in the audience and one of them was the guitar player's wife. <laughs> and we ended that run with people lined up around the block to get in. We have no idea why and, or, or, or how. And a well, lot of those it was people- an amazing musical. Because it was an amazing musical, but who found it? Anyway, a lot of producers found it and we ended up interviewing producers for a week and then you know chose a bunch and it became an off-Broadway show and then a Broadway show and, and, uh, and then a, an abortive television series. Um, Although along it's back. the way, along the way, you picked up a Tony nomination for yourself, so that was nice. Tony, Tony nomination and a and a Olivier. Um, that's not which, that's not the average background for a guy who now pedals in space. <laughs> no, no, it's it it. Well, yeah, it's very it's very peculiar. Anyway, when that was over, I decided I'd had enough of of New York and the music scene, and I loved the movie business from my writing experience, and I and and my wife. My girlfriend then wife now got a gig um, at Disney, so they moved us from New York to LA, and I put myself in a race between writing and studio executive, and the latter won. So I ended up as a development executive um, at Warner Brothers and working for Michael Douglas, and and most recently at uh, a p place called Ascendant Pictures, which is an indie. We did Lord of War and Lucky Number Eleven and a bunch of stuff. And then that went the way of all indies, which is to say, under a tombstone. <laughs> and and uh, and the guy that founded it, um, who was a video game god in the '90s, he created a game called Wing Commander. And he a game that that essentially created an entire industry. It created an entire industry, and it was the first game to to integrate live film elements into video games. Um, so Chris decided to. Um, he wanted to go back to that. He launched a, a, a crowdfunding campaign he thought was going to raise him two or three million dollars, and he could make a game. Is now raised two hundred million dollars. It's in the book of world records, and we're building two two games, and thus my video game experience. I started working for him about two thousand and fourteen. So, moving into the video game world, you had you played video games at all as a as a younger person? Or is um, <laughs> long ago, I, 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 um, I had a habit of going to this great jazz bar in New York, 
um, it was a, just a funky Upper West Side place, and it it was peopled by like Ellington graduates and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I started to resent the Ellington graduates because they had Pac-Man, and I said, "Fuck the music, pardon me." <laughs> and and I only wanted to play Pac-Man. Well, and you know the 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 early era of video games, of course, you know, weren't in your home. Uh, you know, they were these tabletop games like Pac-Man or Defender or, you know, any of those things. But it was it was the move to games at home that really changed the way games are played and the way games are told. It wasn't just about the 15-minute experience of standing in an arcade with a bunch of quarters. It became an immersive um, substitute for watching a movie or reading a book or having a family or a boyfriend or a girlfriend <laughs> that's right um, or a life at all or a life and at it, all you know it, it became you know a, a second life really for a lot of folks yeah and, um, and and that transition has caused a lot there's a big political sort of storm behind that or in front of that that transition which is that there's a because video games started with pac-man and space defenders space whatever it was called it's space invaders yeah. um that had no story so there there has been a you know there's a whole segment of the video game production world that says well we'll just invent the story and then we'll bring some writers in to drop some dialogue in and who cares about the story and then there's this whole other you know naughty dog um world where story is king right well and it seems to me of late that you know the the cool thing about video games and i play a lot of video games um is that you know reading a book or watching a movie um, is a third person experience, but playing a video game with a great narrative is a first person experience. You are the story, you are the engine of change in the story versus just witnessing someone else. And never before in the history of entertainment prior to video games was that really the case where you are dictating at least a portion of the action, right? Um, but what what I found fascinating about the work that you've done, the work that Cloud Imperium does, um, is that a lot of the writing of the video games now is predictive not on action but on emotion. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, um, it's it's a writing for video games is a really weird experience. Let me let me start there because. Um, as Todd says, you're writing. You, as a screenwriter, you have control of your character's actions, and you have control of the camera. So you have control of what they see, what they hear, what they do. And in video games, except you're, unless you're working in a cutscene or a cinematic scene, you have none of that. So you have to figure out, and that means that you either have to admit that you have a protagonist, the player, who you have no control of. Or your protagonist is, in our case, a crew member on a ship that has as a protagonist the captain who has an agenda, right? And you have to decide, or other wingmen, and you have to decide how you fit into that. So, uh, so how, so how, how do you make that interesting, and how do you add urgency to that to that situation? And part of it is what Todd's talking about, where we can we can track the artificial intelligence of the game can track how you behave towards your fellow npcs right not player mm -hmm. characters and 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 we can we can adjust how they react to you and whether or not for example they have your back when you're being shot at in space <laughs> by aliens right and if you if you've been a putz they're probably not going to have your back and if you've been a wonderful guy right so there there's that and we're we're We've been developing that technology. It's not simple, and we've been developing it for years. But it become it starts to become, uh, uh, you know, the gameplay become becomes emotional. The other part of that, just let me say, is a, a game like uh, The Last of Us, which is Naughty Dog's genius game, opens with an incredibly emotional prologue that that sets up the lead character and his world falls apart, and he's racing away with his daughter and his daughter gets killed and he's in this world you know trying to figure out his future and it's a very emotional way of opening it's different than mm -hmm. dropping into pac-man and trying not to get eaten right well and i i think about games that were sort of the forebears to what you're doing which is you know something like a grand theft auto where you know you're being prized for nihilism right 
Um, right. So that was before you really had other human beings playing around you. So in a multiplayer universe, of course, you know, you can have other, you know, people. But when you're writing a game, you're writing for a person and and AI. Is that correct? That's right. So that, that, does the AI presume, is the AI based on the emotions of the screenwriter that day? Or is the AI based on <laughs> the overarching narrative in general? Um. It's a really interesting question, Todd. Well, there, there's a couple of things at play. One is the 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 tone of the in our case, the tone of the game is set by Chris Roberts, who is the genius behind the whole thing, and he has a you know if he could do anything in his life, he would be making World War One films. He's a <laughs> he, he's right. He's a freak for World War One and for the kind of courtliness of that. At least it's ascribed to a, a trench warfare. A trench warfare, but but well, but the way people behave towards one, you know, he's not. He doesn't want a game that's filled with blood pouring, you know, and and lots of swearing and horrible misogynism and and, and all of that stuff that 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 populates a lot of of other games. So that's part part of it. But we in the in the multiplayer world. Um, what we do, the the scripts become uh, for the NPCs for the AI become triggers, right? So, uh, man walks up to a bar, right, and then we write four or five or six variations of lines. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you've got a friendly bartender, you have an unfriendly bartender, you have a bartender that you really want to go home with, right? So there's all kinds of version. It's it's branching dialogue, and you mm-hmm. get to choose that or the ai chooses it in the case that that it's reacting to you know how you've been behaving so you might make a move 15 minutes into the game and then you encounter a bartender in the next you know 15 minutes later in a scene and and how you reacted in that battle scene is going to be reflected on how that bartender responds to you now it can it can yeah as i said it's a complicated the ai is really complicated and and we've been you know, battling it, trying to get it, get it to work. Um, but yeah, that's right. So as a, as a screenwriter, um, you know, you, presumably most of the people writing your, your stuff um, are not also nuclear physicists. So, <laughs> so <laughs> they don't, they don't have, you know, just a huge wealth of ideas about how the tech is going to work. They're, they're more concerned with the story. I mean, obviously they work there long enough they're going to be talking to the the developers as well, but what what's the learning curve for understanding how to write reactive dialogue within a game? Like you can't just pull a talented writer out of you know a coffee shop in L.A. and drop them in your office and say write this scene like you could you know if you need to rewrite on a TV show. No, you um, we we have spent actually years trying to develop that process because it's not it's not a simple one but um pretty much every character in every scene starts in a collaboration between design between design and and narrative Mm -hmm. right so so we're we're collaborating with the people who are designing the way the scenes are supposed to play out and and they're the they're the people who help us sort of figure out what the triggers are right right? for 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 the for that kind of scene um or as opposed to in the single player game which is more narrative driven where the scripts look like scripts except they're branching dialogues dialogue where the player has two or three choices of what of what to say Mm -hmm. which and that is almost entirely and then an NPC in in the in the multiplayer world, um, it's a cl- it's a collaboration, mm-hmm. and we've go- we've gone we've gone you know as it's just worth saying we've gone from just we write the scripts and go and shoot them, to we write the scripts and make design. Um, we, we don't write the scripts until everything is sort of um, sampled out, right? So we mm-hmm. they've sort of done their own kind of figured out how it's going to work and then we write a sample script and then they do scratch dialogue and see whether it actually works for them and then we go back and polish it and then we record it because we were wasting a whole ton of stuff because that collaboration is so complicated right so 
I know you have some sample pages. Why don't we why don't we put some sample pages up so we can we can show the viewers what you're talking about? Uh, okay, that means that I have to be technically literate for a moment. <laughs> you now need to be a nuclear physicist and pull up. Yeah, we have features. sort of. Uh, it's going to happen, folks. We promise. It's going to be deeply fascinating. Until John figures that out, um, I'm going to show you things that are on my desk. Uh, uh, can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is just amusing. I'm just going to show this for a moment. When when I first started working for the company, um, neither the lead writer Dave Haddock nor I had any video game experience at all, basically none. And so the first story that we came up with for the single player game had lots of branching stories. You know, if you do this, if you if if you're successful on a mission. The game goes one way. If you're successful, not successful, it goes another way. And this was our first kind of outline of how the game would look. Oh God! And, and we <laughs> and we showed it to um, uh, Chris's brother Aaron and a bunch of the designers. And we it was really one of the more efficient meetings I've ever had because the reaction was one word: no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> and, and the reason is all of these bubbles are really expensive to build and nobody wanted to waste any of them. So, right. you know, it became a whole other other thing. So this is a sort of a semi sample of a of a um, narrative scene as opposed to a single player, you know, hanging out in a bar scene. And what you can see is the the this is an the wing wingman is an npc and and they can there's several options for how they can how they can greet you and then the conversation actually is triggered by the ai when you enter the conversation right um and and it's and it's so it you know it starts uh the wingman says i'll go talk to to a friend while you grill those lowlifes. So your job is to go grill a bunch of people in the brig, right? Right. So if you approach a guard and your reputation is good, the guard will say this to you, right? And that's based on what you've done before. So if your reputation right. is good from a battle scene 20 minutes ago. That's right. Okay. So, so, um, there, so, and this is why uh, the script for for this game is twelve or thirteen hundred pages long, because you have to write all of these optional lines for all these guys, right? Right. Um, uh, and then the player gets to have a reaction, but sometimes, you know, if the player decides not to approach the guard but approach the nurse, then you have a, a completely different set of um, set of lines and so for for the writer when they are sitting at their computer and working on this and and i'm i'm sure the viewers are looking at this and thinking like oh my god there's no way i'm ever gonna write a video game <laughs> uh, uh, before they even sit down to write this is there a larger sort of production meeting saying this is what we want from this scene like these are the three options that we really want to come out of this scene um no you would think you there is now when we start when we started i want to repeat neither dave or i had any video game experience at all and 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 um and chris had a particular vision of how he wanted the process to work and he basically wanted the writers to write it and the he wanted to flip it and have the writers write it and then design to go and build that game that was that was scripted so um the writers came up with all with all of this, but in but in a concentrated conversation with with design, who would give feedback, right? So that they would say, "We don't like who the player is turning out to be, or we don't like who you've made the nurse, or we think they come off as wimps, or 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 something, right?" Um, but most of this of this script was generated by the writers. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and. And we're we're changing that going forward. Um, 
so that we don't we don't end up um because it's caused a certain amount of conflict right um right. so in, in our case you know the player um there's a, you know you need help with something the nurse says and then there's a couple of options for how you can react so you have an inner voice now the adrenaline from flying is wearing off i'm a little sore and then he can say or she yeah i did gang get banged up on the last run or they can say on second thought no i'm all right i just i just need some rest right so we're we're trying the attempt is to make it feel like the player has agency right even though we weren't able to sell that that crazy diagram where you know what you say or did totally changes the course of the game right so for for i there's i i see in the comments there's lots of people are fascinated by this stuff um and we'll get to your your questions in just a sec i, I promise uh, I just, i'm sorry just when you want to get to it this is this is this is the other version of a script just Got so it, we yeah. get both versions of scripts so this is um i'm actually recording one of these starting at two in the morning tonight because we're recording <laughs> it in, in in london um <laughs> well you could i'll be up <laughs> but Right, so th these are these are basically wild lines, right? So mm -hmm. the event is the player collides with an enemy in combat state, hits the enemy, taunts the player, and you've got uh, the NPC will have two or three different choices of lines that the AI can can choose from. And what's crazy about this? I mean, there's lots that's crazy about it, but right. um, this be these be these triggers, these sort of states become uh, part of the AI program, and the AI knows that if 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 this if this collision happens, then it can a attach one of these three lines to the generic pilot who is mm -hmm. to to whom it's it's happening, right? And it and it happens, you know, immediately. The AI makes that makes those decisions. So, you know, you record thousands of of these things. So. And, and, you're yeah. you're someone's writing all of these things and then someone's recording all of these things so you're making a game how, how long does it take <laughs> <laughs> well in our case it takes a very long time um uh we 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 have a couple of of real challenges that have, that have been part of why it's taken so long both the games that we are creating are ginormous. They're just enormous, and they're and they're really elaborate. In the in the multiplayer game, their, their will when is done be 150 star systems, all with planets and worlds and places to land that you can explore, and each one of them, like you know, in in many games, you can see a planet, but you can land at the place that's built for you to land on, right? And the mm -hmm. rest of it is just kind of graphic graphic bandages right right you can land in our game anywhere and explore anything and 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 what matt that means is that the potential cost by which i mean the, the memory drag is enormous and so or it can be enormous so part of what we've done we've has taken us so much time is we've had to develop the the um, software constructs that allow us to deliver the game without melting down anybody's computer or or uh, causing vast lags and you know in frame rate and stuff and but as a storyteller i mean th this is like this is the challenging thing is you want to be able to tell a story and just tell it you know if you're writing a script or you're writing a book or whatever you type it and and, and there it is it exists right that's right um, in a script, of course, you type it and 300 people have to move across Los Angeles and film it. Um, but here, it's not just it, its not just all the production. It's me sitting at home, too, who has to like, have a decent computer to do all of this. That's it, right. It really changes the way I think storytelling works because it's, it, it's, you're involving everybody <laughs> yeah and one of one of the really interesting challenges of that is not everybody wants it right right <laughs> not there are a lot of people who say really i don't care about the story at all we've had we've blow, had uh, huh i just want to blow shit up 
they just want to blow shit up. Yeah. And, and, and we have conversations. We've stopped having them because they became kind of contentious where the designers would say, well, what happens if uh, you, the player, the player is in an emotional conversation. NPC is, is, you know, um, confessing to them that they just broke up with their wife and you just want to stand and wave your arms in front of them. What happens then? Right. <laughs> to which Chris said they pull out a gun and shoot you, you know. <laughs> but you have, you know, it's a it's a real decision on the part of the of the of the game makers how much freedom of motion and how much freedom to be kind of rude or not rude or right. you know. Well, and I remember just even as a kid, and this probably says something about why I write, you know, murder books now, is like I'd be playing Dungeons and Dragons and I'd get bored because the dungeon master was a crappy storyteller. Right, and, you know, it'd be like you're an orc shows up, and I'd just be like, I stab him in the face. I'd be like, well, you can't just stab every orc in the face. There's no game if you do that. And I'd be like, well, that's what I would do. I would stab the orc in the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, and it goes back. It goes. It goes back to Space Invaders, right? right. There, there was no story. It was just you against the machine, and it was really fun. Right, just blowing stuff up is fun, yeah. but. I guess it's a different kind of entertainment. Like that, you can have those, you know, first-person shooter games. And it's entertaining. You can play Call of Duty with forty of your of your buddies and blow crap up, or you can immerse yourself into a world, which is what you're doing, and it's an entirely different experience. We've got a ton of questions, and and folks, we're really just, you know. We're we're just tapping like literally the bottom of this <laughs> giant iceberg here. Um, hopefully, we'll be in person again uh, next year, and John will come out to Sanibel, and we'll have a huge, big event for this. Um, but I saw a really good question here. Uh, Keyshawn asked a question. Uh, as someone who's trying to get into narrative design um, and reporting in the industry, do you feel like there's a clear path to get there, or is it different for everybody? I was trying to get into narrative design and reporting. Those are two different things, right? I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. So, to, how, how does someone get into the industry specifically for narrative design? Um, I never know how to answer these questions. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, we have, um, there's, I mean, there are schools, there are pro, you know, there are academic programs to learn game theory and game design and and, mm -hmm. and and game writing it's becoming more of a more of a thing as as film schools figure out that you know they need to update themselves into the 21st century um there are internships um we a lot have, of the big game companies have like blizzard has a pretty big internship program i know that much yeah yeah they they do i mean our um we don't um, in fact, the only internships that are run at the, our company are run by me, and <laughs> and and and, uh, and I've managed to get and I've never managed to get anybody integrated into the narrative team because it's so small. There are only really two guys that are writing the game, but mm -hmm. but um, but I've gotten people integrated into editorial and into um, I've brought a couple people as. Um, to performance capture shoots as actors and um i've hired a producer too but yeah um, it, it seems like um you know my the the folks that i know that are in the design side they really you know they they have that degree in in design or game design and they they get in at the bottom essentially at a blizzard or you know three art or whatever it is um but you know for the on the writing side um do you need to be a produced screenwriter to start writing the narrative in these games? No, and in and in fact, um, of our, of our senior writing staff, one of them had no video game experience, but some screenwriting experience. He went to film school and he wrote some scripts with with Chris. The other uh, came out of the video game world, and what we're looking for in terms of of um, joining the narrative team are people with video game experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be academic, it can be academic or it can be, you know, with a, with a company, but we're looking for people who we don't have to train up because we don't have time. Right. So I see here there. Oh, here's a question that's popped up. Uh, how do you feel about taking the time to write dialogue for an NPC that the player may never talk to when they play it? God, 
it's it's like writing spec episodes of friends and then it gets canceled or something where it's, it's like playing in a band for a wedding but, right. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like this is this is the thing about being a writer a lot of this time you write something and no one ever sees it <laughs> You know, the majority of the time that's the case is, you know, if, if you're a screenwriter, most screenwriters write a gazillion scripts and none of them ever see the light of day. Yeah, um, I think that, that, that this this is an inter a different question, though. It, it, it's, you know, it's a branch of it, it goes back to that crazy outline that I that I showed where nobody wanted to build worlds that people wouldn't want to see. But in this case, we you know, our spaceships are got are gargantuan and. And you never know. You can't. We can't determine which NPC somebody's going to want to talk to, or mm -hmm. bond with, or have an interaction with, or go on a mission with. So we write lines knowing that some players will interact with some characters and some with the other. And it, we don't think it's frequently the case that nobody will interact with any of them. So right. we're not so worried about that. But you have to know that you know, everybody will have a different experience of the lines that you write. <laughs> right. Um, here's a good question from uh, Zavari. Uh, I'm currently studying in digital media, focusing on becoming a game designer. I also want to be able to write stories for games. What advice would you give when it comes to making unique stories? I mean, this is this is the existential challenge, right? Like, it's just what you said. Like, you, you hope that you can find someone who knows game design who's also a storyteller. Um, but if you if you're a great game designer and you suck as a storyteller, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't matter if you have unique stories to tell if you're no good at telling them, right? Well, you you can uh, you can collaborate with a writer mm -hmm. as a designer, right? You can have a you, you can have an idea. Um, I mean, we're within the context of. And I, you know, I want to preface all of this by saying I have ex uh, experience in the game world at exactly one company. Right. Right. But um, we ha we have um, designers. We don't encourage them to write because it it always ends in conflict. But <laughs> sometimes sorry, armed, sorry. sometimes not. <laughs> but yeah, but we don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, but but we do encourage them to, you know, I mean, the designers are all coming up with, um, you know, in, in the multiplayer game, we have mission givers. Well, who's coming up with the missions? You know, often it's it's the it's the designers that say, you know, how about this? How about how about that? In our case, the overall story of the game, the, you know, is is Chris Roberts. Right. So mm -hmm. um, he has control of that. But inside that. Um, the designers have have a fair amount of input into what what the game experience will look like, and the game experience. A lot of the game experience is is narrative. So, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing that I, um, well, I mean, I've got so many questions about this theory, all this, and I should tell you guys, those of you that are watching, uh, I've had the unique opportunity of going to John's office and talking to the video game writers, and they sit in this giant room with monitors the size of your house. And there's <laughs> there's also just an entire room devoted to the spaceships. So you can just walk into this room and there's like 40 designers and they're all nuts and they're all designing spaceships. And it's just like one guy building a gun. Um, <laughs> and so that's, it's like Disneyland when you go in there. But and nuclear physicists. <laughs> and nuclear physicists. But the, the screenwriters, the, the, the guys that are writing the game, they have a really clear vision. Um, you know, when you talk to them about stuff. But what I wonder sort of emotionally, John, um, and this is sort of related to a previous question, like, you know, of not seeing your stuff. When you're working on a project like this that's taking so long, how do you keep the writers motivated other than you're paying their mortgages? Um, yeah, there's that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, there's a couple of things. One is the game is always evolving, right? And... Um, so there's always new cha new challenges, um, and and um, and and the the writers are the creators of and the keepers of the lore. So there's actually a giant backlog on on our site of the history of the universe and the history of this world and the history of the United Earth Empire and, and all of this stuff. And they're they're always expanding that stuff. So it's mm -hmm. always 
you know, they're always getting to be sort of J.K. Rowling, you know, they're always <laughs> without her problematic views on without, rates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, without that, and also without her yachts, but <laughs> but but um, but but you know, the challenge is eternally interesting, and we and we're we're working on on you know future iterations of the game, and that's really an, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so right now, what can people play? Uh, Star Citizen is the multiplayer uh, game, and there's modules of that out there, and, and people can, you know, sign up and play that and buy spaceships and and <laughs> invite invite their friends, right? And, and uh, do you go and play the games yourself now, or are you still, do you just try to stay out of it because if you start playing, then you'll have ideas for story? <laughs> <laughs> I um when our family first bought a Wii, part of the entertainment, weekly entertainment was my kids trying to they would try and get me to play and then watch. Just watch <laughs> me try and play a video game. I'm, I'm not good at it. If that if that answer. So I I have played Star Citizen, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm a you know not an expert, an, an aficionado. No, I know every, you know, a lot about the, the story and the scripts and, and the characters and stuff. But, but I'm not. All right. Well, let's see. We got time for it. Looks like one more question here. Uh, the oddly named Bmore twenty one nine nine nine. Um, it must have been hard to go through school with that. <laughs> Ask, uh, is there a difference between video game theory and narrative? I don't know what that means. So the answer is yes. <laughs> I, I don't. Um, uh, I mean, there's I, game I theory. Narr obviously. Narrative. Yeah, I think narrative is a subset of game theory, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, get, get, you can play games with no narrative at all. Right. Right. Um, so, in some senses, narrative is an overlay on game on game theory and and how video games operate. Mm -hmm. And but then the narrative exists. I mean, the the narrative has can't just be theory because then people don't feel tension, right? Yeah, that's less than, more than a two in a two minute answer. <laughs> hanging hanging on to urgent. Well, in the multiplayer game, the urgency because you're in basically creating the adventures, right? So you, right. you create the urgency yourself. In the single player game, which is supposed to be a narrative driven game, hanging on this is the the real challenge is hanging on to urgent any sense of urgency when you have no control over the player's actions, reactions, emotional state, or what they see and hear mm -hmm. is really tricky. And it it's it's part it's part of what keeps it answers your earlier question. It's part of what keeps it interesting because we're always trying to improve on that. Right. Right. Well, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your what's going to be a very long day since at two o'clock in the morning. You're going to be working on Star Citizen. And incidentally I'm looking in here and it looks like uh, a couple folks are playing the game right now. So oh, good. You're you're not doing this for nothing. The, the kids, they love the Star Citizen. It's an amazing um, game. It's an absolutely amazing game. Yeah, and folks, if you're ever in L.A., call me, and we'll drive to John's office, and you'll get to see what it's like to be in absolute geek Disneyland. It is so cool. They have their own coffee shop inside their offices. Um. Yeah, and and someday all of that will be reopened, and we'll go right. back and re right. <laughs> revisit it. I forgot that there's there's a vast global pandemic. Yeah, uh, there's nobody great, there. John, thank you so much. And oh, you know, no. before we go, uh, John has a book, Screenwriting Behind Enemy Lines. Uh, if you are a traditional screenwriter, absolutely fantastic book. It's going to teach you everything you know. And John has been responsible for some of your favorite movies, starring Keanu Reeves. That's the other more important. Thing. <laughs> With, without without John, there is no sweet November. I want y'all to know that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Good I don't to know see what you. to say to that. <laughs> nice to see everybody. I didn't see everybody, but it's been fun being here. We pretended to see everybody. Yeah, and now I have to figure out how to log off of this. We have twenty. Studio. Oh, we have twenty-three seconds left. Hold on, no one move. <laughs> We're gonna stay right here for ten more seconds, staring right. at all of you, pretending that we have nine more seconds of content to provide you with. <laughs>
<laughs> Someone tell me if the Raiders are winning real quick in the comments. <laughs> All right.